<laughs> well, good morning. It is morning or are we afternoon? Afternoon, everybody. Uh, great to see everybody here. I know we've got plenty of people following online as well. Uh, my name's Tim Wright, and with me here is uh, Nicola Henderson. We are both advisors at Expo North in slightly different areas. Uh, I am involved with the crowd economy and digital, and Nicola, you might want to introduce yourself. Um, but we're going to be hosting this session today, crowdsourcing for heritage. Very, very uh, important and valuable topic, I think, because it speaks to an activity that's grown a lot in the last few years uh, through uh, the period of lockdown, which has come up quite a bit. Sad to say, we don't have um, videos. I'm really sorry, and we don't have chocolate records either. So <laughs> you're going to have to persist with us uh, as is. But we do have a fabulous case study uh, later on from Dr. Nini Yans, who's going to join us online. Uh, so welcome all. Nicola, um, would you like to do your introduction yourself? Um, we're going to do this. We keep saying Morecambe and Wise, Abbott and Costello. I hope it doesn't descend into Laurel and Hardy, <laughs> um, but well, I'm sure we'll manage. So. I'm sure we'll get through it somehow. Um, yeah, I'm Nicola Henderson. I work as the Heritage Advisor for Expo North, um, and I work with museums and heritage organisations all across the Highlands and Islands, um, and also do other arts and heritage projects uh, across Scotland. Um, and just with that hat on, um, at lunchtime at around half past one we're going to do a little visit over to the West Highland Museum. They have a VR experience of the original fort here from 17, well, the 1746 version of the fort. Um, so we thought if anybody would like to go over and try out that VR experience and um, we can go over and have a little look at the museum and it feels extra special because they'll actually have closed by then so we'll have it to ourselves as well. Um, so I'll probably hang around the coffee table around half past one once you've had some food um, and take a few people over then behind the scenes at the museum. What more could you possibly, I don't think there'll be small people wandering around or anything like that. But um, <laughs> we don't have videos, but we do have some really fabulous old technology. Uh, slides, ladies and gentlemen, slides. Uh, and the reason we have slides is because I am a management consultant. It's a little bit like Alcoholics Anonymous. I stand at, I am, my name's Tim and I'm a management consultant. So slides are very much part of uh, keeping us on track. So. We're going to do a little bit of definition of what crowdfunding is, why it's relevant, why you might want to think about it. We're going to talk about some of the approaches to doing some crowdsourcing. Uh, we'll look at a few examples and then, as I say, we'll bring in Nina to uh, talk about uh, a specific and very fascinating case study uh, that she's been undertaking in uh, Luxembourg. So I suppose with no, if I can make the do for work, uh, there we go, it's good. It's good. I said, how many buttons are on this? They said two. I said one would be better. Uh, <laughs> so here we go. Quick definition. What do we mean by crowdsourcing? It's the process of uh, looking external for your organization to attain information or input in a particular task by enlisting the services of a large number of people, either paid or unpaid, typically via the internet. Now, I know you're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to read slides, but I'm doing it just to help you out in case this is too far away. I have a little bit of font envy today. <laughs> my, my badge font is considerably smaller than everybody else's. So, uh, uh, so the principle behind this is that you're looking for expertise, skills, support, and engagement from people and organizations that are external to your organization. And in this particular case, we're thinking about heritage, but it applies in pretty much any sector that you want to think about. Um, and the principles that we'll talk about will be applicable if you're not in the heritage sector. But I just want to, if Nicola will let me, I just want to do a straw poll just to make sure you're all awake. Anybody by show of hands been involved in any crowdsourcing projects? Oh, well, that's good. That's good. And and can I ask uh, the lady there? Were you crowdsourcing? Were you asking people to assist you, or were you involved with uh, assisting another organisation as a crowdsourcer? That was you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> ah, interesting. Crowdfunding, crowdfunding being an important subset of crowdsourcing. We're not going to cover that in any great depth today, but I suppose it's time to remind that if anybody wants to yep. contact Expo North Digital about support on that topic, 
both Nicola and I are available to, to assist with you. So do feel free to get I in touch. I would say, in fact, there's a slide going to come up later on that shows that, because I know Vanessa there from the West Highland Museum, that they do crowdsourcing in the way that we're going to talk about today in terms of gathering more kind of information. Because actually, to me, crowdsourcing is something that Heritage kind of does already, maybe in a smaller, smaller scale, but we don't tend to use that language but it is how we engage with our audience to help either feed in information for projects that we need or as a way to help us with a, a few museums. We have a backlog with documentation. We may use volunteers to help us to do that as well. It's just a very specific form of audience participation that Absolutely. makes that a bit more meaningful. Yeah, good, good stuff. So I suppose we're then going to say, why would you want to do this? Why would you want to get involved with a crowdsourcing project? Or why, in particular, if you're a heritage organization, what are the things that you're likely to get out of a crowdsourcing um, project? What are the sort of uh, activities you might want to undertake? Um, I suppose I think the key, the key thing for me to start off with is to say that this is founded in the principle that not all the smart people work for you. Or not all the smart people are necessarily within your organization. And this is your opportunity to get skills and expertise and insight and perspective and contributions from people that are not necessarily immediately within your orbit. So on a sort of philosophical level, that's the kind of uh, key aspect to it. But here's a few things that I know, Nicola, you were keen on pointing up. So maybe you want to speak yeah, to these. Yeah, I ones. mean, I think in terms of gathering knowledge for a project, you may be looking to do a kind of memory project, it could be around universal themes, looking at a world war topic, or local themes around maybe local festivities that are unique to your area, or tragedies that have occurred, and you're looking to gather those memories. Um, it's a way to kind of pull that knowledge in. And as Tim said, it's about tapping into skills and expertise. A lot of museums um, and heritage organisations across the Highlands are small, they may have a couple of staff members, or they may be enti entirely voluntary run. And it's a way to just look at where those skill gaps are and help you to target and bring in new people to help you deliver those skills. Again, look at the backlog. Like I said, if you've got a lot of documentation that's been done and you don't have the resource or the capacity within your organisation, who else could you tap in to help you with that? And connecting with the diaspora. Um, we all know that we've had lots of people who do leave the Highlands but who have strong, strong connections here. And that by doing that, that's the very important part of it to me. It's about that kind of deeper engagement, kind of more active participation, which is going to help you have a greater impact for your organisation. Um, where the, more, the deeper connection you have, then perhaps you look to build that relationship more. It helps you achieve your educational goals. Also, perhaps your commercial goals helps you to build your volunteer base and your capacity to deliver more work. Um, but also to perhaps think about how they could donate ways and for you to look at new ways for um, generating income as well. Absolutely. And, and I think, although we said we weren't going to specifically speak about crowdfunding, one of the real attractions of crowdfunding is not just the financial aspect that you can draw in through a crowdfunding campaign. It's this wider crowdsourcing piece, the insight that you can derive. So if you're bringing a new product to market, you can get tremendous insight through a crowdfunding campaign about what features and what price point might be acceptable. So these are very, very powerful and useful and valuable things that you can achieve from a crowdfunding a project, which is that part of a, a, a wider crowdsourcing area. So you'll hear people talk about ideas of co-creation and these, these types of activities. So we understand some of the why you might want to do that and the circumstances in which you might want to do it. The key thing, I suppose, to ask is how does one go about crowdsourcing? Um, the next slide, I think, is, is my favorite, actually. Now, this might seem like stating the obvious. Define what it is <laughs> that you want to do. You would be amazed on how often this is completely overlooked. This is a structured and complex and engaging process where you need to put in a considerable amount of planning. We'll talk about that a bit further. But to illustrate the point of the pitfalls of not doing that, who knows of the Boaty McBoatface. <laughs> There's a perfect example of if you don't plan, don't have clarity around the way you're going to undertake the project, crowdsourcing can go terribly wrong. And Boaty McBoatface, for those that don't know, is where they attempted to crowdsource the name for the new Ar uh, Antarctic explorer vessel, and that's what they ended up with. Uh, I don't believe it's actually called Boaty McBoatface. I think it got eventually yeah, called David, Attenborough. David Attenborough or something more. More suitable. I quite like Boaty McBoatface, but, um, <laughs> but these things can 
facts can go terribly wrong. Uh, so this idea of defining what it is that you want to do and why is very key to be able to put around these things uh, a structure. This is not a case of simply asking a question of the crowd and expecting to get some uh, logical answers back. You need to have a framework within what this will work. It is not a case of an infinite number of monkeys with an infinite number of uh, typewriters miraculously and serendipitously creating either complete works of Shakespeare. Did you want to, to, to speak on this topic in particular? Um, I don't have a lot more to add. I think while we're here talking about digital and technology and in that definition it did seem yeah. mostly use the internet, it's not always about technology as well and I think when you're making decisions about the audiences and goals that you want to achieve it's important important to have those first and then look at what the technology is right, not the other way around so the technology doesn't come first. Yeah, so if we were thinking about it from a, a crowdfunding perspective, we have a, a, a four-stage plan that we would typically use to structure any kind of crowd engagement model. And it works just as well in a broader crowdsourcing um, context as it does within a, in a, a, f a financially driven one for crowdfunding. We would call that the TAMP process. So First stage in that, it's an acronym by the way, you'll not be surprised, first stage T is targets. So understanding what it is and defining what it is that you're looking for is really, really important because without that clarity you can't build a communications and outreach cam uh, campaign very, very effectively. So getting that clarity of what it is that you're looking for. Um, and in a way that kind of links back to this idea of why are you crowdsourcing? There are so many things that you can derive from it, but you need to be clear about the specifics of what it is that you're looking for at this particular time within the context of this particular project. The A of TAMP is audit, which is looking in your organization and looking how, what skills and competencies and resources you have available to you <coughs> to run a crowdsourcing project. And then the methodology speaks to this idea of the, t the, the um, technologies and platforms that you can make use of. And we'll point to a few of those that you, you uh, might want to uh, refer to uh, if you're thinking about, about crowdsourcing. But uh, the final piece is this idea of P of planning. So very, very important to, to have a very, very well-defined three-stage plan, a plan that speaks to prior to you launching your crowdfunding campaign, the activities that you need to undertake and get, uh, get clear and complete before you launch your crowdsourcing campaign, the during the crowdsourcing campaign, and then the post-crowdsourcing campaign. And I think Nina, when we talk to Nina about her, her case study, she's going to have some yeah. interesting insights uh, for that. Now, one of the things, obviously, that you're going to need to do, if my doofer, come on doofer, there we go, <laughs> working with digital volunteers. Not all crowdsourcing is done digitally, but certainly a large part of it is. And I know you specifically wanted to talk about the, the idea of... of well, I think it's a, it's a real strength for the sector. Um, we spoke a bit before in the previous session about effects of lockdown. And one of the slightly negative effects for, for the heritage sector has been reconnecting with some volunteers that were lost during that period. Um, and most of our volunteers are usually ageing, so how can we diversify that audience, how we can connect with new people and crowdsourcing is one of the ways to do that. And to me, because it is about people, um, how that's managed and worked will be where your project succe succeeds or fails. So a lot of the kind of planning to make that bit work is, is so important. Um, and this is maybe a wee bit workshoppy, but I think... <laughs> <laughs> we don't mind workshop. Um, just thinking around sort of those role profiles, writing that really clearly, thinking about what you want them to do. I guess it's similar to a job description, but isn't legally binding and you need to say that and isn't an employment contract, but it still needs to be clear about what you want them to do, what the requirements are, whether they need access to their own computer, um, or laptop and that the role is remote, how you explain what the project is, so it's really clear about what you're wanting them to do, what your overall goals are for the project, and um, what skills you'll need them to have from the outset, because there maybe won't be training around those, but then what opportunities are for them to develop and learn new skills as well. Um, and so yeah, just really thinking about what they need to have already and how they can benefit from being part of your project. And then thinking about who you want to target, who might be interested, that's going to really impact on where you advertise, where you try to recruit, 
um, your community. So who might it appeal to? Again, thinking about things like when can it be done? If it can be done at any time of day, then that means it could be people who are in work or who are studying or who have childcare commitments because they can work around that and that will really help you determine where and how you recruit. And then the real biggie is registering, inducting, managing and monitoring the processes. Yeah. So how you gather that information it could be something simple like a Google form, which goes into a nice spreadsheet, saves you copying and pasting everything and doing it a lot. Um, and thinking about what other permissions you need around data protection and um, storage of data, making that really clear. Doing a normal induction isn't really possible, but it's still a really, really important part of the process. You want to make them feel part of the team. It's important to be able to explain the full project and to be able to understand their motivations for being involved. The more you understand the motivations and skills that they bring, the more that you can help them to um, get the most out of it and that you'll get the most out of it as well. Um, so helping them to be, feel connected to the organisation mm. as well through some kind of newsletter, what else is going on, what are the values of your organisation, who else is in the team so that they feel part of it, you know, maybe getting together um, once a month so everybody can meet so that you help to grow that connection because it's by that deeper relationship they'll continue to be part of your organisation. Um, and then just yeah, thinking about that management again, whether it's using Google Forms or Docs or Dropbox perhaps for sharing things. If you are doing a project that's around transcribing or um, explaining objects that will feed into your collection, you may want to think about how you photograph those records and upload those to something like Dropbox so that people are accessing those to be able to download at their end or not have to download so it doesn't use up space on their site. Um, and they'll be able to share that back to you. And again, just monitor, keeping track of the amount of time that they spend. That's good for funders as well. Um, it's good for you to know and keeping track of how many records have been done as well. That'll set it all up um, nice and smoothly so that hopefully it will go on to succeed. And there's just some examples there as well of places that you can go to look for for volunteers across the sector that can be determined again by the type of project and the type of skills that you're looking for. Absolutely. And it's important to recognise that you may have a range of different co types of contribution that you want from people. It may be that you want them to do practical things and administrative things. It may be that you want their perspective. You may want them just to be tagging things. You may even want them to be contributing artifacts to you. And I know the uh, case study with, with Nina that I keep referring to, but that was a very specific aspect of crowdsourcing where they were looking to collect artifacts and surface artifacts that otherwise would have not been uh, available. So there will be a range of, of activities that you'll want people to undertake. And as you rightly pointed out, Nicola, this, there'll be a range of different motivations for people to wanting to get involved with this. So recognizing, acknowledging, and understanding those different re and motivations and re rewarding them uh, effectively is, is uh, quite important. Now, uh, we're just gonna give you a few examples of interesting crowdsourcing projects that have taken place in the heritage sector. We'll wh whip through them reasonably quickly so we give Nina plenty of time to talk about her case study. This is one I think that you... Yeah, so this is the Food Museum. Um, they were looking for how they could deal with their backlog of circa 40,000 objects that they wanted to be able to get um, into their collection management system and then ultimately be able to create a free public catalogue that they'd be able to host on their website. They used eHive, which I know we have some users of eHive in here. It's a really um, effective content management, si collections management system where people can host their objects. Um, and it's really quite simple and intuitive. So it's good for working with volunteers all across the region. And through um, a wide call out, they managed to recruit over 550 volunteers over 25 years. And they've now completed doing over 40,000 of those objects. And also in terms of diversifying your audience, we can see that their volunteers were a lot younger than our usual audience profile. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a highly successful project. Great, and you can, all of these projects are available online. You can go and find out more from them. This is a particularly famous one uh, organized by the Library of Congress in the United States, which has spawned a whole series of subsequent crowdsourcing projects. But this one was the, the initiator of it, Letters to Lincoln. These were a collection of handwritten letters of Abraham Lincoln, which they wished to, they're digitized in terms of imagery. But obviously the OCR, optical character recognition aspect of that, doesn't work well on handwritten 
um, uh, letters. So they were transcribing these. The great thing about the, this is it actually creates so much more value to the, the, the collection. You know, it becomes a searchable archive. You can analyze it in different ways. It becomes accessible, machine readable in a way that you, you know, so extending your reach of your collection in a way that it wouldn't do if it just remained as a, a collection of handwritten letters. Tremendously successful, many, many volunteers. And as I say, it's uh, spawned a whole series of subsequent ones. Some interesting European ones here, tagging collections of imagery. Uh, so again, adding value to a collection by making them more searchable, groupable, uh, and building journeys through these types of collections. Um, well, the technology. <laughs> ah, here we go, there we go. Uh, so transcribathons and translation exercises. So tra again, similar to the, the transcribing of the letters to Lincoln, uh, taking handwritten records and turning them into, into digital uh, context, but also uh, translating as well. There are quite a number of crowdsourced translation uh, projects going on. And again, the Europeana group I would uh, recommend having a look at. Um, annotate, again, another type of transcription exercise. Um, you can see the popularity of those. Another transcription one here, uh, St. Humphrey Davies' uh, books, uh, his notebooks um, were, were being transcribed. And you can, I'm sure, imagine how you could extend the use of that, that um, collection once you've got it into that digital format. Um, this is Trove, which is an Australian project, uh, which is an interesting example of a national collection, a national library who links with uh, a whole group of other organizations and heritage organizations and the, the public to create a very, very rich source. I can't speak much about the endometriosis in Australia, but, um, but they have a whole collection of, of newspaper annotations as well and um, cultural history and anecdotes that can add a, a tremendous level of richness to their, their collection. Um, and this one... And yeah, so this is a bit, I felt that a lot of the other examples we'd included were mostly kind of transcription and getting people to help you to deal with um, objects uh, that you may have in your collection and work that you were wanting them to do with you. But this was an example that I saw West Highland Museum put out really recently where they were putting a call out for people to contribute memories, photographs, objects that they may have. So it's kind of quite a local bit of crowdsourcing, but it's asking your community to really help you with gaps in your knowledge within your collection where um, you're looking to put together a temporary exhibition with a bit more than you have. Absolutely. Uh, we mentioned that there are obviously uh, a number of tools and resources that you can uh, draw upon to make this happen. And some of them are very sophisticated. Uh, some of them are much more uh, prosaic and straightforward that you perhaps don't think about. These are digital tools in the large part. They can be used uh, offline as well. Uh, one of the reasons the digital tools have proven so successful is this is an area that we've seen grow enormously during uh, the, the lockdown period when lots of people were sat in front of their screens looking for things to do and finding satisfaction and fulfillment by getting involved with these projects that were digitally enabled. This is just a few examples of some of the more specialized tools that you might want to uh, draw upon, like Zooniverse, uh, standard wiki tools like, the, uh, the, like MediaWiki, which essentially underpins Wikipedia, which I think we're all fairly familiar with. And then more straightforward and readily available tools that you perhaps don't think of as a tool that you might use in a, in a crowdsourcing context, but that can work extremely well for collaboration and data gathering, things like Dropbox and things like Google Docs. So there are a whole range of facilities out there, some free, some paid for, that you can make use in this type of, of process. And if you want to look at some interesting reference pieces, if you want to read up more about this, if you don't trust what we're telling you, <laughs> you can hear it from others. Uh, there's some good and interesting reports to, to look at. So the Foundation Projects report gives some good um, practical examples of where, where um, crowdsourcing has been used uh, in other places. But also the Collective Wisdom Handbook is essentially a crowdsourced handbook of, of the crowdsourcing process produced by people who have been very much active in the space, giving you their war stories of how they did it. And there's a neat segue. Yeah. <laughs> war stories. Why did I mention that? 
Well, the reason I mention that is the case study that we, we would like to talk to you about today is uh, digital war history. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Nina Jans, who's uh, coming in online for us today. I hope Nina's there. While they queue Nina up, I will give you a bit of brief bio from Nina to give you an example of just how experienced she is in the space. Nina, uh, Dr. Nina Jans is a PhD scholar, lecturer on military history. She studied European history and archival sciences in Hagen in Germany and Haifa in Israel. Israel, started, received a PhD in cultural anthropology and military history from the University of Hamburg, Germany, where she focused on the impact of death and violence, as well as the memory of World War II in the post-war period in Germany and Russia. In 2021, Nina and her team organized a national crowdsourcing campaign in the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg to collect war letters and diaries from World War II. The project proved to be a great success with Nina and her team gathering a wealth of valuable information from war letters and diaries. With this information, they conducted extensive research on the war experiences of individuals and the profound impact of the war on them and their families. And to join us from uh, Luxembourg, I hope today, with Nina. Is Nina there? Can she's we bring there, Nina like in? Tim. She is there. Tim, she's over there. Like yes, I'm here. Over there. Oh, yeah, over there, here. right behind. <laughs> Sorry, Nina, you're behind me. I couldn't see you. I apologize. Great to have you with us. Thank you very much for joining us. Can I hand over to you and you can tell us about your fabulous crowdsourcing project on the DigiWar history? Yes, definitely. Thank you so much, Tim, for the introduction and also Nicola for inviting me um, to share today my insights and my um, about my project. And um, so you talked already a lot about um, like what, how to do. So I would like to use this opportunity to speak about my project, but also about our learning process and, and the lessons learned in general about it, because we had a lot of setbacks. You know, if you would have considered what you said before, it would have been easier. But anyway, I would like to share with you um, our uh, crowdsourcing project. So um, as Tim already introduced, um, we are situated at the Luxembourg Center for Contemporary and Digital History in Luxembourg. And our project, Wallax, is about uh, the conscripted soldiers um, from Luxembourg, because Luxembourg was occupied by the Nazis during the Second World War. And the population was considered as Germanic by, by the Nazis. So the men uh, were conscripted into the German army. And also the women, uh, because you can see here as, as well, uh, like women um, on, the, on, on the starting slide, they were also conscripted into labor service. Um, thank you for here for the next um, slide. So we are um, focusing on really specifically on these people who were born between 1920 and 1927 and who lived during a time in, in Luxembourg. So our goal is here, of course, quite clear. And uh, But we couldn't find much information about these people, like their private lives and how their real, like a personal experience was in the archives. That's why we um, then, um, no, please, the slide, yes, yeah. I will tell you when the next slide. Yeah, is, is that okay? Thank you. Um, so we are we didn't have much information about the personal um, experiences, and in the archives we couldn't find anything. Um, it was aimed that we will do um, interviews with the war witnesses, but our project started this uh, in March 2020, so perfect with the pandemic. So we couldn't meet face to face and we couldn't enter as well elderly homes uh, because of the of the pandemic. So that's why it was like a plan B to collect um, the documents like uh, written documents from these people. That's why we had like, um, for example, this uh, idea about the crowdsourcing campaign. Next slide, please. Thank you. In February 21, we we started to um, to uh, to launch a national press and poster campaign. So we we um, put in, for example, posters in in spots where elderly people are, like mostly pharmacies and like hairstylists for the el elderly ladies. But there was also like big um, national um, uh, like a like um, document. No, um, so our 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 um, project was covered by the by newspaper so that's why we got a lot of um from this newspaper and from the posters we got 
our volunteers because we were, I mean, and Tim and, and Nicola, you were speaking about how to get actually volunteers. We just announced it. So we just um, announced like a call for the contributions um, that we are looking for um, family members or children of the soldiers who have still documents at home. And and with the um, with the article in in the newspaper, so this this was like the biggest uh, uh, success. We got then a lot of phone calls, and I have to say we were quite overwhelmed, very overwhelmed. We thought maybe in the beginning we will have around 50, maximum 50 uh, people who can offer us something, and maybe 10, 10 letters. But we were completely overwhelmed uh, by the by the phone calls. Um, so as you can see here, the flyer uh, there's uh, also like a phone number on it, and we made the mistake to put a phone number like a like a mobile phone number on it. And so people called us as well if Friday evening and on Sundays. So it was quite um, a lot uh, to to and and to handle um, during the next days. But still, over 200 people called us, and so it was a huge success and we noticed that um, the people um, it took a lot of time just to speak with them I mean I mean when they called we we wrote down their number their their contact information and also what they can offer but it was not very clear sometimes for the people I, I mean like I said I would like to uh, I, to be honest with you as well and to uh, speak about our setbacks and our our mistakes so um, here the statement like a mission statement is would have been maybe better to explain or like what what are we expecting as you can see here on the flyer uh, it, it states in Luxembourgish please tell your story but it's a lot of text so people don't read text and so they just saw something like black and white pictures from a war and they thought okay I can offer something because I was a child during the war so they called us but these people are, were not our target, um, so of course this took a lot of time. Just you know, because we not, we never cut um, like a phone call and said no, we're not not interested. Um, goodbye. We of course listened. So sometimes uh, people call, uh, called us. Uh, I mean, one hour they were talking, and you said like, yes, interesting, but <laughs> you know that uh, in, you could give your story, or you can go to the to other to another museum. But we are kind of very interested only in the stories of the soldiers and the women who were uh, who, um, um, who were conscripted. So this is a little bit maybe we should have maybe clarified that earlier. Or just maybe write down uh, that we what we are not looking for, but this could have been also maybe misleading, um, but because people then wouldn't read like the uh, we are not looking for. So anyway, uh, so we um, around 30% of the people we had to reject because they offered us other documents, for example, about um, about um, uh, um, repression measures or they were like children and their witnesses like the liberation by the Americans, but. This is not was not our target. The next step was then to call back the people and to set up an appointment because we offered them they can come to campus and um, but mostly we visit them at home. Uh, this was this took around um, three months, like mainly like working full time, almostly on it. Um, so we went there and we took the time to to talk to the people. So some people really wanted to to um, share their story. So we had tea and 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 also biscuits, and then of course uh, discussed their family story and also their um, uh, and the documents as well. We took this uh, the documents to to campus. And then scanned it there, and then um, then uh, gave it back at the end. So we didn't keep any originals. So we have just a digital collection. Because as as you know, uh, I am I am located at a university, and we are not not an archive. And that's why we um, also supported the others if they would wanted to give the originals to another museum or another archives. We also encouraged them to give uh, the originals uh, to the museum. We had also um, consent forms um, with them. And here I have also to, to uh, say this was also not that easy because uh, we didn't plan like that so fast. So as Tim said, we have you have to plan um, ahead and really 
uh, know what you want to get. So with the content form, it was mostly about uh, the privacy of of the of the family and how we can use the documents. Some documents were quite sensitive. Uh, even this, the, docu the most documents were f uh, from the war. But some people, for example, didn't want that their father would be published, uh, like a picture of the father would be published in the Nazi uniform. Because still, this chapter is a very, like, very sensitive topic, and it's a big, a big wound in the Luxembourgish narrative um, to talk about it. But actually, the Luxembourgish man um, participated in the war on the German side, even if they were forced conscripted. But still, this we had to be very, very sensitive with this topic. Uh, some people also didn't want um, but some sen sensitive information will be published in, for example, in the letter. So we agreed to anonymize um, the information. I mean, because we did, because there's are private documents. So, of course, we followed the, um, the conditions by the family. And Luxembourg is a very small country. So everybody knows everybody. And if maybe in some letter would have been said, like, he was a collaborator with the Nazis, and the family is still there or, or still lives in the village, that could have been maybe other... I mean, it was also, like, ethical questions for us, even based on GDPR or, or on any data protection law, we could have been um, allowed to publish this information because the affected person is dead. But still... It's um, because we wanted, of course, the trust also from this participant. And I, I will say a little bit more about on, on, on the other um, slides, but this was also our concern. And then, I, like I said, the documents were scanned on campus and then brought back. Next slide, please. Okay, then I would like to um, say a little bit more about our participants. So our target was, um, well, our first target were the, were the war witnesses. But as you can imagine, I mean, these people were born in, in, in the 20s. Not everybody is um, alive anymore. And if they are alive, they're quite old. So, of course, the memory is a, is, is a different one than like, priv um, like private, like written documents. So we aim for the children or the maybe also the grandchildren from these people. Um, because some people um, still kept the, the documents. We were also, um, some people said that we were even too late because most of this um, war generation died maybe in the last 20 years. And when this person died, then the children does just uh, clean the house. So uh, we were a little bit late, but still we got some and documents. So here, our participants were quite quite clear. Uh, like our our target was a very clear. Like Luxembourgers who were born in Luxembourg and also um, have some documents there. This was easy, but like this was the easy part. Like, um, but then uh, the participatory aspect was a little a, a different one. Um, in in the beginning, as as researchers, we just thought we will just get the documents and that's it. I have to say, this was a little bit egoistic. But then I noticed participants also want something from us. They, it's not just that we just take their time and the documents and the family stories, but I have the feeling that we should also give something back. So this was for me, uh, like also like a learning curve <laughs> went quite high that I, um, learned that, that it's it's so we have to take time as well for the participants. I mean, not, not just in managing or like um, curating all the documents, but also like speaking with them. I underestimated that completely, I have to say. And here, um, because in taking the time and going to their houses and speaking with them, we then gained even more. And this is what I really uh, didn't expect. <laughs> So it was like, like, like a quite nice um, effect also from from this participatory um, aspect. Um, I don't see quite my, my slide online, so I have to... Uh, we can see your worried. slides. Uh, That's good, uh, yeah, because I wanted to read, um, but I, I it's bl very blurry. Um, so the aspect was... Um, wait. 
I'm just giving my uh, okay. Um, we I cannot read it. I'm I'm I have to f find my own slide here. <laughs> Apologies okay. for that. Um, but I just. Uh, I think we were on your third slide, I think, Nina. Yes, uh, yeah, it's, it's too, too light. Um, that's why I cannot see where I am. Uh, but now I have it. Good. So you are uh, on the third slide. Great. So, um, but that's about every aspect. Like I already said, it's like also this relationship to each other that we <coughs> visited them, that we gained like their, their trust and, 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 and also, but, but we listen. So even we gained from this more than I expected. Then we encourage as well the participants to break the silence because uh, the war generation, they didn't talk much about their experiences during the war. So many told us that their father never talked about the war, never taught, talked um, about what he, what he did or what he had to um, what he had to go through, maybe also because he was captured um, in in Russia, and so it 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 was a, a difficult time. So even like uh, coming forward and offering us the documents was for them also like breaking the silence and for them. So this was uh, as well and very uh, un unexpected um, effect uh, from this participatory aspect. Then we provided them also like a platform to uh, to receive recognition because in Luxembourg about these people is is not much known. Just maybe uh, one or two people like wrote a memoir and they are famous, but most of the people kept silent. So we now also with this outreach or with this crowdsourcing, we kind of recognized that they are part of this of, of this national history, but they are also like in important they 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 can contribute some some participants said but i you know i i don't know anything and just i can offer you that and my father was like a nobody my father was just a little worker and i was like no this is important he's a big part of this national history as well so even this recognition just to be there listen to them and just to be there was was even uh, for the participants sometimes really um enough sometimes I, I would say. Um, next slide, please. Um, about this interactions um, here, I would like to uh, just stress that out more. Like I said in the beginning, I really didn't expect that that the participants want something from us. In, so I, we just wanted the documents, but it was not that that easy. <laughs> Of course, so we wanted, of course, to get this information and just the documents and then say a goodbye. But no, it was, of course, much more. And even with talking to them, um, for example, we could gain so much more information than the documents could have, than the documents could, uh, could provide. For example, we received many, uh, pictures, like here on the, on the right side, um, there are like sometimes like portrait of, of photographs and of course we could recognize this person but sometimes there were also group pictures and we didn't know who's who and then then the children or the niece or the nephew told us that oh, this is this is like the brother of a neighbor or this is like an, of somebody else so we got much more background information about the the family, about the person itself, about uh, about the soldier, for example. Sometimes also some crazy family histories or some, so we could understand also like the context better. Um, in some letters, uh, we we um, faced that some some letters were pu were put out of of envelopes and we couldn't um, know who the sender was. So and uh, some. Some letters were just written with, um, like, in English it would be John, but in Luxembourg it would be like Jempi. Um, so many letters started with Dear Jempi, and Jempi was a very common nickname for, for Jean-Pierre. And Jean-Pierre was like one of the most popular names in the 20s and 30s in Luxembourg. So we really didn't know who's now 
Le Jean Pierre was it like a brother was it like the like a father was it was was it like a neighbor so even with that information the the participants like volunteers provided us with more um in yeah with uh, with additional um uh, research uh, uh, and support i would say um so this was for us even more helpful and i didn't expect that so this was uh, so we got even data of of the data um, that um, helped us to extend our research. For example, we could then um, start searching in another direction about this uh, this person. Um, the this interview it wasn't like we our history interview. We we just went there and just talked to the people. But even this data we put into the later into the into, into our data workflow to know more to 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 get um, more like i said background information to start looking for other family members so this helped us a lot uh, for our for our research for the participants um like i said it's it's um even this this recognition that we went that we listened and sometimes even two hours i was there and listened and it was sometimes very emotional as well because the participants told me that based on our call they started to look for the documents and then they read the letters sometimes for the first time sometimes for, uh, for the second time but in reading the letters just Going through this memory of the father or the mother again was for them a very, um, a very uh, therapeutic, they said. So they could understand even more like the trauma of, of a pain that the father had because maybe the father wasn't so kind or maybe not because he had still this, this memories about the war. So they said they could understand their parents better. So even for them, it was like a big, a big, like a big step to even to um, to read the letters and to talk with us about it. Um, so we were also um, sometimes very many, many tears and very emotional. So even like this, this listening. We also provided the families with uh, research tips, uh, where they could find more information. So we could contextualize something. Uh, sometimes the family of like told us like a, a family um, family myth and this wasn't true because I mean with my background in military history I said no that's not like how it was and then like oh interesting so sometimes there were like lies but um, it was sometimes just funny uh, just to contextualize a, a little bit like their own family uh, their own family history and then, uh, as I said, we didn't um, keep the original, so we provided them as well with, with um, tips, with professional tips, how to store the documents. I mean, I have also a background in archival science. Of course, I could like say, please, you know, you have to store it like that, um, away from the light, etc. So this was also like helpful how they can preserve their own family memory for the other generations, for example. And uh, they received also the scans, so we digitized uh, for them. So when we brought back the originals, we gave them also like in USB flash drive with the scans itself. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So even this also, I mean, Tim, you said about like three steps, right? Even if I don't. Uh, don't miss it. I had also like I I I put my um, presentation also in in like three steps. Like we launched the like the preparation, the participants, which takes a lot of time, uh, in um, speaking, um, feedback, uh, etc. And also like the post processing. This uh, so we're still on it. I have to say, and we I mean we have to we launched a crowdsourcing a campaign too. Um, two years ago, and we're still in the post-processing of 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 the scans. So of course we have to scan the documents, and then um, so we have uh, then the scans they have to be ordered, etc. Um, so this took a while, and then it's we are still ongoing with the implementation of the data and and metadata. We started also to to, to transcribe the documents and um, tagging and adding the metadata. We mostly use here Transcribus. But we have our own database, so even this implementation, I mean, we have around 7,000 files and we have 5% of 
we then we made five percent so it's it takes a lot of time so you have to have like a workflow you have to have like an implementation um like a, a how you want to I implement the data etc etc the next step is then to uh, plan um also a better accessibility of this um of the scans of of our digital collection uh, our funding ends now, so after three years, so we our, our project ends, and it's kind of very sad because we are like in the middle of the project, and now the next step would be um, to apply again for funding, and then it would be even like a bigger focus on citizen science or the crowdsourcing. So then we really want to use the crowd for for transcriptions. So this is the goal, and also with the with the first um, crowdsourcing project. So like I said, I learned a lot myself and then have a, I hope the next project will be a little bit um, more clear and also not in so many uh, setbacks as well. Next slide, please. So I would like to show with you as, as well. Uh, my slide is a little bit, uh, I think it's it's uh, from, uh, we're from uh, the format changed anyway. Um, like what Tim already said, um, so if we do that again, uh, we need like a clear mission statement, um, define the target group. This is very important. So before we launch, you have to know exactly what you want and what you don't want. And also like uh, ex expect uh, setbacks and that you don't get the data or the, the task, what you get. So you have also like what is like, like the, um, like the minimum and what is like, of course, like what, what, what will happen after that. Uh, so they have to be, there has to be like a workflow and the data implementation is also very important. And here again, I would like to, to stress out the participants are also very clear. So they need also to know what happens with their contribution or what happens with their working hours. I mean, with, with their own contribution. Um, so we cannot just ask them, please give us the documents and that's it. Many were disappointed. Many people called me and asked me when I publish a book about uh, uh, about uh, the father. Like, this is not going to happen. I mean, I said that, but maybe it wasn't clear enough. So that's why you have to really, like, uh, concentrate also on the communication. Um, so what to expect and what not to expect. Uh, but they're not any disappointments and not making any promises <laughs> which you cannot keep. This is, um, for me, what I learned from my uh, communication with participants was quite um, Im important. And then, like I said, this, the post-processing is, is also very important um, with the workflow. What do you do with the data they contribute or, or um, how do you, um, well, of course, um, uh, implement it in your own catalog or database or your exhibition depends of course where you work and then about the team um, this was in the beginning also not very clear who does what so we had um, to divide the task very very quickly and uh, this has to be also clear before uh, who can do what or, or who's able to do something or like for example one has to communicate with the participants the other is then responsible for the data the other is responsible for the legal work. I don't know. It, it depends, of course, on your project. Yeah, so these were my, my uh, failures and best uh, best practice tips. Um, I don't want to repeat myself um, because I have very, very similar um, other slides. Uh, so if, if, we sh if we look at the next slide, I also recommend uh, the the collective wisdom handbook, especially from the chapter from um, by uh, Mia Rich, uh, she's um, from the British Library, I think. Uh, so yep. I learned from that a lot, right? Yes. And then also what Timor also said, which was Cryofans, but also uh, one of my favorite projects as well, uh, based on Zooniverse. Like Zooniverse is an American website. Uh, and they and the arrows and archives use it. So arrows and archives is like an archive for the uh, persecuted uh, Nazi victims, and so there are all the documents um, which can um, clarify like the fate of the Nazi victims. So it's quite impressive what they do. So what well, is one of my favorite crowdsourcing projects? Yeah. So I don't, like I said, I don't want to repeat myself. <laughs> so I would like to to finalize now, mm. and I. 
think uh, even this, the, the little failures we, we got and the setbacks, we still could establish a very unique collection in Luxembourg. And I, like, I and my team, we learned a lot uh, also from the participants themselves. And I, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to our next project. Well, if we get, if we get the funding, I mean, it's about all of, uh, about the funding, right? So I would like to thank you, uh, for listening. And, um, I'm here, of course, for any comments or questions. Nina, thank you so much for that. That was fascinating, insightful. Always great to, to hear from people that have actually done it for real rather than just talking <laughs> about it. I think we're kind of up against it time-wise, so I think we're going to have to forego questions for, for now. But uh, I will say that uh, both Nicola and myself will be around for all day, so if you have any specific questions to us, uh, to ask us, please feel free to do that. And again, if this has whetted your appetite to make you want to explore this in a little bit more detail, do approach Expo North Digital and uh, we should be able to support and help you in a range of different ways on these topics. So nothing more, I think, for us to say to, to say thank you very much, Nina, for, for giving us that insight and thanks for all of your attention and engagement through the session. So thank you. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>